Hello everyone. So it's fairly common in rigid body dynamics problems to be told to assume that an object rolls without slipping. However, we don't usually stop and think about whether this assumption of rolling without slipping is actually valid. And so what I thought we could do in this video is to investigate in some detail the validity of the no slip assumption for one particular case. We're going to consider the case of a round object rolling down an inclined plane. So I've defined all of the key parameters of the problem on the screen here. We've got an object with mass m and radius r which starts at rest and is then released and allowed to roll down the inclined plane. I've referred to it just as an object, so it's some kind of round object because this allows it to be either a sphere or a solid cylinder or a hollow cylinder or a disc, any kind of round object, and we're not assuming anything in particular about the details of its shape. I've specified that the moment of inertia, that's the moment of inertia about the center of mass of the rolling object, which is I, is going to be kmr squared. This is just a way to parameterize the moment of inertia of any uh, round object and k is just a dimensionless parameter that varies depending on the details of the shape. For example, if it's a sphere, k is two fifths. If it's a solid cylinder, k is a half. If it's a hollow cylinder, k is one. The plane is inclined by an angle theta relative to the horizontal. And I've said that the coefficient of friction between the plane and the rolling object is mu. Mu is going to be a very, very important parameter here because even without working through any details of this problem, we have this intuitive sense that uh, in order for an object to roll without slipping, there has to be enough friction, right? So this problem essentially comes down to quantifying how much friction there has to be, how big the coefficient of friction has to be to allow it to roll without slipping. We're going to approach this by considering the forces acting on our rolling object. So I've just drawn all of the forces that are acting on the object onto the diagram. We've got the weight mg acting straight down. We've got the friction f pointing up the plane, trying to uh, slow its motion. And we've got the normal contact force n pointing straight out perpendicular to the plane. And we're going to derive some equations using Newton's second law and the rotational analog of Newton's second law. Therefore, we're going to need to get accelerations and angular accelerations involved as well. So I've defined the linear acceleration down the plane as a and the angular acceleration of the rolling object about its center of mass as alpha. So let's resolve our forces parallel and perpendicular to the plane. Let's do perpendicular first because that's easier. Resolving perpendicular plane, uh, there's no acceleration perpendicular to the plane. The acceleration is purely down the plane and therefore the uh, force pushing away from the plane, n, is equal to the perpendicular component of the weight which is pushing down or pulling down, and therefore n is equal to mg cos theta. If we resolve forces uh, parallel to the plane and apply Newton's second law because it's accelerating down the plane, uh, the net force down the plane is going to be the parallel component of the weight, which is mg uh, sine theta, and then we have to subtract the friction which is acting the opposite way, that's going to be equal to the mass times the acceleration. We can come up with a third equation by considering the torque acting on our rotating object and applying the rotational analog of Newton's second law, which says that the net torque uh, about the center of mass is equal to the moment of inertia multiplied by the angular acceleration. You'll notice on my force diagram, I've been very particular about where exactly I've placed those force arrows because uh, we're considering torques and therefore the perpendicular distance of each force from the center of mass uh, is very important. Now you'll notice the mg, the weight, and n, the normal contact force, act straight through the center of mass and therefore exert zero torque about the center of mass, which is great. It's only f that exerts a torque about the center of mass and the perpendicular distance of f from the center of mass um, of our rolling object is simply r. It's the radius of the uh, ball or cylinder or whatever it is. And so the torque is r times f. They are perpendicular to each other. The radius r and the friction f are perpendicular because the angle between a tangent and a radius is 90 degrees. And therefore there's no angle trigonometric factors in there, we're going to set that equal to the moment of inertia i multiplied by the angular acceleration. And we specified earlier that i was kmr squared, so I'm just going to write that as kmr squared alpha. I think it's important to point out at this point that all of the equations that we've written down here, these three equations here, these are always valid whether the object is rolling without slipping or whether it is slipping. Right? We haven't input any information into those equations about whether it's slipping or not. So notice that the first equation is enough to determine the size of the normal contact force, 
assuming that theta is a known quantity, we're going to be considering theta to be a known quantity. Uh, while the second two equations, this one and this one, have three unknowns combined. The three unknowns are the friction f, the linear acceleration a, and the angular acceleration alpha. So essentially, the first equation is sort of a separate thing from the second two equations. The first equation only involves the normal contact force, but for the two uh, remaining equations, the ones that I've underlined there, we've got two equations for three unknowns, f, a, and alpha, and therefore these equations alone are not enough to determine f, a, and alpha. So what we're going to do for our sort of additional input into this system of equations is assume for the time being that the object is indeed rolling without slipping. That gives us an additional constraint, and then we'll use that to solve for the frictional force that would be required in order for this no slip condition to be satisfied, and we'll consider the validity of that result later on. So if the object is not slipping, the uh, condition mathematically for that is that v equals r omega, where v is the linear speed of the object, and uh, omega is the angular velocity of the object about its center of mass. I just want to be totally clear on where exactly this condition comes from. So take a look at this little diagram of our rolling object. We've got our velocity v going down the plane and our angular velocity uh, omega. So what we need to do is consider the angular velocity of a point uh, not at the center of mass of our rolling object, but a point at the surface of our rolling object. Now, if you think about it, let's consider a point at the top of our rolling object. That point at the top sort of inherits a linear velocity of v down the plane, but it also has some extra motion because the top of this rolling object is, is rolling that way. And the overall velocity of this particular point on the object is going to be v plus r omega. What about a point uh, right at the bottom of our rolling object, well, we can do something similar, except that point still inherits the velocity of v going down the plane, but uh, the rotational motion of that point um, is going that way. And so instead of an overall velocity of v plus r omega, we have a smaller velocity of v minus r omega. Now, what does no slip mean? It basically means there is no relative motion between the point of contact of the rolling object um, and the surface itself, which means this velocity, the velocity of this point of contact relative to the surface has to be exactly equal to zero. So v minus r omega equals zero implies that v equals r omega. Now, because our equations are in terms of accelerations rather than velocities, we want to take this condition v equals r omega, differentiate both sides to get a is equal to r alpha. Let's see what this implies about the amount of friction uh, which is required under the no-slip condition. So if we go to our torque equation, this would imply that rf is equal to km. Now, think of this r squared alpha as r times r alpha. We've just said r alpha is a, and therefore r squared alpha is the same as r a. So rf is equal to km r a, and then the r's cancel, and you find that f is equal to km a. So now we've got two equations, this one here and this one here, for two unknowns, which are f and a, because we've eliminated uh, alpha via the no-slip condition. So we could either solve for f or a. What we're more interested in is solving for f because the friction is the quantity that sort of has a limit. It has a maximum possible value depending on the nature of the surface. So let's combine our equations and eliminate the acceleration. So we get mg sine theta minus f uh, is equal to m uh, multiplied by, just rearrange that one to get a, it's f over km. So f over km. Uh, this m will cancel with this m. Then you can add f to both sides and factorize uh, to find that mg sine theta uh, is equal to f into 1 plus 1 over k, which I'm going to write as 1 plus k to the minus 1. Then it follows straightforwardly that f is mg sine theta divided by 1 plus k to the minus 1. You could leave it like that, or if you don't like that negative power, you could multiply the top and bottom of that fraction by k to get k mg sine theta uh, over 1 plus k, right? This one turns into this k, and the k to the minus 1 turns into 1. So just to emphasize the physical meaning of what we've just found, we have found that this quantity here is the frictional force that is required to maintain the no-slip condition. So how can we assess whether this frictional force is valid in the sense of uh, whether this frictional force 
can actually be provided by the surface, uh, we have to use the fact that uh, the friction is less than or equal to mu n, where mu is the coefficient of friction. In other words, the friction can only become so large. The maximum possible friction that can be provided by the surface is mu n. If the required amount of friction f exceeds mu n, that means the surface cannot provide the amount of friction required uh, to maintain the no-slip condition, and therefore the object will slip. And therefore f is less than or equal to mu n is precisely the condition under which it can roll without slipping. So now we just have to substitute in our expressions for f and n. So f was this, so let me copy and paste this, um, so kmg sine theta over 1 plus k, that's supposed to be less than or equal to mu times the normal contact force. One of the first things we did in the video was find that n was equal to mg cos theta. The mg's cancel and you can divide both sides by cos theta to turn the sine into a tan and then you find that the condition becomes mu is greater than or equal to k over 1 plus k tan theta. So this is our result. This is the condition for no slip. We have to uh, ensure that the coefficient of friction is bigger than this critical value k tan theta over 1 plus k. It's interesting to compare this with the coefficient of friction uh, required to keep a particle from sliding down a rough plane. If you consider that problem of a particle uh, sliding down a rough plane, you find that mu has to be bigger than or equal to tan theta to keep that particle stationary and stop it from sliding down. So this result is quite similar, but it's just modified by this factor of k over 1 plus k. Now, k over 1 plus k, just mathematically, is always going to be less than 1, because k, the numerator, is smaller than 1 plus k, the denominator. In fact, uh, on physical grounds, k, this parameter in the moment of inertia, um, cannot be more than 1, and therefore k over 1 plus k cannot be more than a half. What that means is that the coefficient of friction required to uh, keep the object rolling without slipping is always going to be less than the coefficient of friction required to keep a particle from sliding down the plane. In other words, it's easier to keep the object rolling than it is to uh, keep the particle from sliding. It's also worth noting that the quantity k over 1 plus k always increases as k increases, um, and therefore the coefficient of friction required as k gets bigger um, also gets bigger. In other words, if you increase the moment of inertia by increasing k, you increase the threshold coefficient of friction, which makes sense because if the moment of inertia is bigger, um, then you need a bigger amount of friction to create the angular acceleration which is required. Just to make this a bit more concrete, if k is two fifths, if we've got a sphere, then uh, that factor is two sevenths, so mu is greater than or equal to two sevenths of tan theta. What if you want to distinguish between the coefficient of static friction and the coefficient of kinetic friction? Which coefficient of friction are we talking about here? It's actually the coefficient of static friction, even though we're talking about a moving object, because there is no relative motion of the point of contact and the surface. Remember we were talking about this point here, there's no relative motion between the object and the surface, and therefore it is the coefficient of static friction uh, which is relevant here. If you were to keep increasing the inclination of this plane in such a way that the uh, condition for no slip uh, was eventually not satisfied, then what would happen is it would keep rolling and it would keep accelerating um, both linearly and in an angular sense, but the angular, uh, angular acceleration would just not be able to keep up with the linear acceleration and it would start to slip. In the next video, I'm planning to step up the difficulty a little bit and uh, consider the more involved case of an object rolling down a round surface. And in particular, we'll consider the question of whether it is actually possible for the object to continue rolling all the way up until the point uh, where the object loses contact with the round surface. So I hope you will join me for that. And thanks for watching and I'll see you soon.